let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually and say right now. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it, it's actually a big piece so of it's that process yeah. that a developer or let's say... As the Kubernetes ecosystem really boomed. Welcome to this week's Ask an OpenShift Admin live stream. So today is January 26th, which means that we are now officially fully into 2022. Um, so if you didn't know already, uh, yeah, it's it's 2022. Johnny, I don't know about you, but it's hard to believe that we're already a month in. Um, you know, this is our third stream of the year. I know, man. It, I, yeah. I feel like every year I'm like, oh, I can't believe it's already this late in the year, you know, but like time flies when you get old. Yeah. So I'm, I'm telling you now, Johnny. Um, Valentine's Day is coming up, you know, so my, my wife's birthday is one month away. I'm, I'm trying to stick, get ahead of these things, right? 2022 yeah. resolutions. <laughs> kind of set that calendar reminder up, you know. I feel like this is like an annual fight with my wife and I where I forget like, oh, yeah, crap, Valentine's Day. Yeah, uh, so we've been uh, we've been married for almost 20 years, right? And uh, mm -hmm. my, my wife is like, my birthday is what I prefer. Like, you know, we can we can tone down Valentine's Day. It's okay. Yeah, you know, she, she doesn't seem to mind that, you know, 20 years in. It's awesome. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. Uh, this is the Ask an OpenShift Admin Office Hour, which means that we are here. Like if you have ever had a professor, a manager who had op uh, who had office hours, we're here to answer your questions. Uh, so whatever it is that is on your mind, things that you want to talk about with regard to OpenShift, that's what we're here to, for. Uh, you know, ask those questions. Feel free to message us in chat on whatever platform you happen to be watching us on. Uh, the the software that we use behind the screen behind the scenes rather uh, restream make sure that we get those regardless of wherever you're at and then our wonderful producer Stephanie in the background um, she does a great job of making sure that Johnny and I don't don't miss questions as well so uh, today we are very happy to be joined by Annette Cluett and Annette is one of our I, th I think your title is principal architect Annette uh, but I'll, I'll yeah, let you I'll introduce start. yourself okay thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm Annette Cluett. I'm in the same uh, team as um, Andrew and, and Johnny. Uh, I re I'm in the hybrid uh, platform business unit and recently um, have been doing a lot of work with disaster recovery uh, solutions that uh, work with OpenShift as well as uh, persistent data and how we make all of that work together with advanced cluster management. So uh, my background with Red Hat has mostly been uh, integrating storage uh, capability or solutions into uh, OpenShift for the last five years. Yeah, I know, I know, Annette, you usually have some of the most popular uh, summit sessions around storage integration and all that other stuff with OpenShift. So mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm happy you're here. I'm excited to talk about today's topic. Um, there's, there's some really interesting and really cool tools, things that... Um, I have learned a lot just from our few interactions with each other um, as we've covered this topic. So it's it's something that's exciting to me. Um, so our hope nine, I see your today's first crazy question. Can you access user metrics data via the OCCLI? I don't think so, not directly. I, I, I think you could connect to one of the Prometheus pods and do a query that way, but I don't think there's like an OC command that'll extract that info. And Andrew, Andrew has a question as well about what should you do if you're in a disconnected OpenShift cluster? Um, do for... I, I'm assuming he's, he's referring to DR, like the... Ah, the, the okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, hold on to that one for just a moment then, Andrew. Um, I, and I'll also note that we have done a couple of streams on uh, disconnected. So we'll uh, I'll be sure to note those in the blog post when it comes out. Um, on that Could, note... Do we want to just answer that quickly, though, just... So uh, I'll be showing it, but essentially a connected or disconnected. The only real difference is whether or not you've, you know, mirrored the images that are needed for all the operators and the, the custom resources. It's really no, no different than any other operator or, or capability. Yep. Yeah. So um, the last time that we did our disconnected deep dive, we reviewed how to do that uh, operator mirroring, including how to prune the registry so yeah. that it's just specific ones. So yeah, important, uh, yeah, I'll be sure to include those links um, on the blog post. 
Um, speaking of which, uh, we're getting through the blog post back uh, backlog, so be sure to keep an eye on cloud.openshift.com slash blog for those. Uh, so last week's blog post will be posted this Friday, or the blog post associated with last week's stream, I should say. Uh, and Dean, um, for anybody who doesn't watch or hasn't seen Dean's blog, uh, he did a phenomenal follow-up himself. Uh, so he he didn't get through all the stuff that he wanted to talk about. So he he went and recorded like another 50-minute video or something that talks about a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, in our blog post, we link um, over to his blog post um, on uh, veeducate.co.uk if you uh, want to go ahead and go there. But uh, yeah, he, he did just a phenomenal job. I know Dean's anxious to come back and uh, talk with you all again and answer those, uh, you know, our hope nine, all, all those crazy, crazy questions. Uh, so let's um, kind of quickly get through our top of mind topics for today. So that way we can focus on Annette and, you know, application disaster recovery. Uh, so the first thing that I want to talk about today is a couple of CVEs. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, See, I want this guy share. So we recently announced uh, a couple of CVEs, 2022-0185 and 2021-4034. And I, I spent, um, I've already spent, I don't know, an hour and a half this morning kind of digging into these. And in particular, if you scroll down and look at these, you'll note that OpenShift is not listed in the affected platforms, but RHEL 8 is. And the same thing is true of this one over here. Uh, so we see RHEL 8, uh, but we don't see either OpenShift or CoreOS. So I had a couple of conversations with engineering this morning. I had a couple of conversations with product management this morning about um, what, what does all of this mean, right? So OpenShift is affected, but to varying degrees based off of what's inside of here. So if we scroll up here to, um, which one is this? This is 0185. So we can see here, OpenShift container platform where the default restricted SCC is used, the issue is not exploitable. So OpenShift, while CoreOS is RHEL 8 based, and therefore it would have, you know, uh, obviously the same kernel, OpenShift is not affected. Um, so uh, effectively what I've been talking with product management about, and we've since reached out to the product security team is, you know, can we still get OpenShift listed in this, you know, list of, of affected platforms, even though it may say not affected, you know, with additional details there? Um, because I, I think, you know, most fee, most folks don't necessarily read through all of these notes up here, you know, for every CVE, rather the first thing, at least certainly for me, first thing I look at is, is my platform affected in this list? And then if it is, then I go back and read all of the details there. So just be aware of, for 0185, that one is not or does not affect OpenShift, but it does affect RHEL. Uh, for the other one, 4034, technically OpenShift is affected, but to a lesser degree, uh, effectively because, um, from what I understand, it, we don't we we don't uh, encourage or, or we don't um, I should say uh, uh, want folks to do you know, SSH or something like that into the nodes. Um, so therefore you can, um, I won't say it's not affected, but it's just lesser affected. I need to get some more details on that. Um, however, I did see this morning um, that the fix for this has been incorporated or already built into the uh, the uh, CoreOS build. Um, so as of this morning or maybe late last night, so look for one of the future Z streams. I don't know if it will be next week's Z stream or if it'll be the week after that. Um, but in one of the soon to be released Z streams, that should be fixed inside of there. Um, Johnny, we have a question in chat. I, I think we got it. Like we're just, it, it's more along the lines of like the disconnected um, DR and it sounds like an upgrade process. So I think we got it handled. Got it. Um. Yeah, caveat, if you've customized your SCC, that's a really good point, R-Hope9. Um, a lot of folks are using customized SCCs to um, usually loosen permissions. Um, in particular, I know some folks do that with, uh, somebody asked me last week, is it possible to have an NFS export that is used by external systems as well as by pods? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, you have to manually create the PV. Um, but you also will probably have to modify your SCCs in order to 
basically um, allow the right UIDs, both internally and externally, to be used so that you don't end up with crazy permissions conflicts in between them. Um, so very good point, R Hope 9 Thank you for highlighting that. Um, let's see, the next one that we wanted to talk about here is MicroShift. Uh, so MicroShift was, and if we look at the blog post here, January 19th, uh, so it was last Friday was when they published this, and it made a bit of a splash. Uh, I think there was a Hacker News thread. I think there was something on Reddit as well that talked about it. Uh, so if you haven't heard of this or you aren't familiar with it, it's a uh, it's it's not an official thing yet. It comes out of our, uh, 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 what do they call themselves, Johnny? Um, oh, I don't know. I, I, yeah. If you would have asked me directly, I would have known. But like, it's it's one of the um, just I can't remember, what are they, development it, teams. Yeah, it's like an advanced engineering team or something mm -hmm. like that that works. They may even work out of the uh, office of the CTO. Um, so uh, effectively, they're targeting you know how to deploy OpenShift onto things like as you see here a Raspberry Pi, um, which is something folks have been asking about for a long, long time. Uh, so th this one was really cool. It was really exciting. Um, I haven't had a chance to try it yet. I only have one Raspberry Pi, and it's a, a Pi 3, not a 4. So I haven't had a chance to try it, but it's something that I'm looking forward to being able to try in the future. Um, we'll make sure to post all of those links. I'm sorry, I haven't been paying attention in posting links. Um, I'll post this MicroShift one first into Twitch here. And then I'll post our two CVEs just after that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the MicroShift thing. This is... Um... You know, like when you, you think about like a small binary that you can install on, you know, an IoT device or a laptop or something like that. You know what I mean? Something not not quite the edge data center, you know, big machine, something very tiny. And you can run, uh, you know, an, an OpenShift uh, API. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And they walk through kind of this blog post is really in depth, right? They, they walk through what is MicroShift, right? How it communicates, what it deploys, all of the different components that are associated with it and kind of why it's different. And if you click on this here, um, so if we click on that link, it'll take us over to the GitHub repo that has everything that's inside of MicroShift, including, you know, the documentation to deploy it and all that other stuff. So it, it's, you know, we get asked a lot about, you know, how can I put... OpenShift onto these super low resource edge devices. Um, and by super low resource, I mean things that are like, you know, two cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. So, you know, e even in line, maybe x86 instead of ARM, ARM but in line with like those, uh, the the new, the, the Pi 4s. So I know lots of people will be interested in that. Um, yeah. So let me catch up on chat here, Tiger. That's what I'm doing too. Yeah, MicroShift doesn't support all API types. Um, CS, so yes, that is correct. Uh, so it will be a subset of the total components of OpenShift. It won't be a full OpenShift deployment with, you know, uh, I, I'm, I don't know precisely what's in there, but it may not have metrics, for example. Metrics may be a, an add-on day two, depending on the amount of resources that you have available. So again, look through the docs, you know, check out what's there, see how to deploy it, all the packages that are there. Um, just be aware that it, it almost certainly will be a subset of, of the OpenShift APIs. And, and one thing, big picture, like if you look at it long-term, it, it can integrate with ACM, so the Advanced Cluster Manager. So like it, it will present itself as, an, as a uh, managed cluster through ACM once, once we get down that path. So it, it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. So mm -hmm. ACM, if zero-touch provisioning and all of that stuff gets integrated with something like MicroShift, that would oh, yeah. be really cool. I uh, know, man. Like, just straight-up Transformers, you know, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the next one, GitOps 1.4.0. Um, I, I, you probably know more about this one than I do, Johnny. Yeah, so the, the GitOps uh, operator updated to 1.4.0, like you said. Um, there's a lot of big changes that are coming out in that. Um, and the, the biggest ones are obviously like the Helm upgrade, but there's, um, subscriptions are now a resource that will be, uh, that'll have health checks against it. Um, so just something to be aware of. Um, and then another piece of this is, uh, it looks like there's some RBAC stuff. I haven't had a chance to mess with it, but like the, you know, like right now you have to kind of manually implement some RBAC so that way you can have uh, cluster level, um, management at some of your lower level, uh, Argo deployments. And so it looks like there's a lot of that stuff built in. So I'm going to mess around with that, talk to Christian and those guys and, and get a better handle of, uh, of how that's going to go down. And I'm excited about it. I, I just checked my calendar. There is a GitOps uh, Guide to the Galaxy tomorrow. So 
I, I suspect Christian will be talking about that during his live stream. Shameless plug for that too. Yeah, he's got that, and it, they're talking about HashiCorp Vault, so that's going to be a really good one. They're, they're going to have a two series on that one, so that's that's going to be awesome. Oh, nice. So uh, mm -hmm. talking about secure secrets with uh, GitOps and all that. Yep. Very cool. I'm, I may have to tune in if I have the opportunity. It, you, usually that um, Thursday afternoon, about when his show kicks off, is when I want to sit down and, and listen to our show in order to create the blog post and all of that. And I can't do both <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. Uh, I used to work with a guy who like, he could sit and listen to a podcast and listen to a phone call at the same time. And I, my, my brain just doesn't work that way. Um, I know. It, I'm, I'm very singular. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> any of you all on the stream, you know, I can't even talk and type at the same time, right? Uh, status of Tecton pipelines. Uh, should I use Tecton pipelines or Argo CD workflow? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think they are probably slightly different use cases, but it is outside of my area of expertise. Um, so Tecton pipelines would be like a a replacement for a Jenkins, you know, pipeline or something like that, a Jenkins workflow for building an application. Whereas an Argo CD workflow, I think is more, is not necessarily used for builds, but again, I'm purely guessing on that. Uh, Johnny? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't say for sure. Yeah, I, I, but I think you're right on track. So um, there is... There is another stream that covers that. Um, which one is it? It is the, uh, and the, the legend level up said, hour. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. No, go ahead. I, I was going to say Christian jumped in and he said use Tecton. Oh, there you go. Christian, I hope leg day is going well. Uh, <laughs> if, if anybody doesn't know, usually Christian listens to our show while he's in the gym. And for whatever reason, Wednesdays are, are leg day. So <laughs> Christian, I've been on the same team for a long time now. <laughs> Uh, and last but not least, DevConf. Uh, so DevConf, sorry, I got you while you were drinking, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> so DevConf, um, which there is two DevConfs. There's one in the U.S. and there is one in the in Czechia. Yep. Uh, so the one happening right now, or is it right now, or is it this weekend? Um, is this in weekend, yeah. Czechia. Uh, mm -hmm. So I know Christian has actually gone and presented at it. Um, you know, back when we could travel. Um, I know it is titled DevConf, like implying developer conference, uh, but there actually is quite a bit of material and quite a bit of things that will be interesting to us as administrators. So I will, um, I'm still sharing. Uh, so DevConf, if we go to uh, schedule, and I happen to already be at the page, schedule is live. So you can see there's a ton of stuff that's all here. Um, I don't know if this is a paid for or a free access one, but look through the session catalog. There may be a lot of things that are interesting to you. Um, I saw that there was several GitOps stuff in here that um, I was hoping to be able to check out. Um, but yeah, it's another great conference. It's another one that is, I think this one is hosted by Red Hat as well. It's at our, uh, our site over there. Um, and now the name of the city completely escapes me. Brno. Brno. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. And, and shameless plug for my team. I've got two, I've, uh, two or three teammates actually presenting at, uh, at DevConf tomorrow. So if you want to check it out, it's, you know, some of the validated patterns and then some um, extensions on GitOps. So it's, it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Just looking here on, on my screen, I see Daniel. Daniel does, he always has great presentations. Vadim mm -hmm. is on the engineering team. Um, uh, you know, Diane. So if, if you, uh, are on the Kubernetes Slack um, for OpenShift. You'll see Vadim in there quite a bit. Um, so Diane is our community manager and stuff like that. So there's there's quite a bit of Red Hat representation. There's also quite a bit outside of Red Hat as well. So um, yeah, give, give it a, a look if you're interested. And that is, that's all we got. That's, that's all of them. So, as we mentioned at the top of the show, as you've seen in our title and all the social media and stuff like that, um, you know what we intend to talk about or what we want to talk about today is, uh, well, application-centric disaster recovery. And this is something that Annette has had to correct me on a number of times because it's different doing application disaster recovery than doing like cluster disaster recovery. And it's a very important distinction as well. So. Uh, Annette, I'll hand over to you, and I, I'm I, I'm excited to hear and to learn about this. Okay, yeah, th thank you, Andrew. So, um, 
first off, there was a question in the chat, and I'm uh, I'm having issues figuring out how to answer the chat. But is is uh, Red Hat uh, Advanced Cluster Management going to be discussed in terms of uh, disaster recovery? And the answer is yes. So um, I thought what I'd do first, just to sort of start the the discussion off, um, is go ahead and just look at sort of the the different scenarios. Let's see here. So in terms of, um, is, that, is, it, is it loading? Yeah, can people yep. see now? Yep, yeah, it looks good. Okay. So in terms of just sort of application high availability, um, if you look at installing, uh, say, OpenShift in, a, in an environment that has three availability zones, um, this would be, you know, like uh, AWS or GCP, Azure, um, out of the box, you know, a deployment, as long as there's topology labels, you know, OpenShift is going to spread um, the important sort of resources that need to, to have quorum, meaning they need to survive a, a, an AZ outage. It's going to do that out of the box, right? Um, so this is something you get uh, right away. Now, some of the deployments, say bare metal or... Um, um, say VMware, don't, you know, out of the box maybe make use of topology labels, but in the yeah. future they will. So the, where it says the third bullet there, ODF, that's, we call it, that's OpenShift Data Foundation, used to be called OpenShift Container Storage. So that also, in terms of deploying the, the storage, the OpenShift Data Foundation, that also makes use of the topology labels and, and lays itself out across the AZs so that you have, have the ability to protect against an AZ failure. So, you know, having high availability um, is, is critical, right? Because you want to be able to survive a, a site outage. But in the case of, um, if you're, if this is a single open shift, right? So this is a single cluster. If we look at maybe we want to have multiple clusters, um, this is this is where we need to have some amount of replication, not not just at the storage level, but we also need to have um, replication or the ability to to reinstall the application on the alternate cluster. So it's it's about the Kubernetes resources and it's also about the persistent data. In the case of the solution with, with Red Hat and using OpenShift, we're gonna, um, we're gonna do that orchestration with advanced cluster management. So that's currently um, the solution that, that is actually available as of today. It was um, all the components uh, were released earlier, um, actually late last year, but um, available this year. So all the components are available. And in, it, it's not totally clear from this diagram, but I'm gonna do a, a demo so you, you get the idea. Um, on the alternate cluster, you, you are not actually running the resources, meaning you're not consuming you know, CPU memory until you actually need to use the application on the alternate cluster. The other thing that may not be clear here is that that arrow on the bottom, that can go either way. So. You could have some applications that um, are essentially protected on the, se the second cluster and then other applications that are protected from the second cluster on the first cluster. So, so Annette, just yeah. can, I, can I recap just to make sure I'm understanding correctly? Sure. So we have two distinct OpenShift clusters. Correct. With, and each one has its own ODF deployment inside of there. So Correct. it's not not a spanned ODF deployment or anything like that. No, no. And then we have uh, ACM, so Advanced Cluster Manager, managing each one of those clusters. Correct. Yes. So and and for the applications, and I, I have a feeling you'll probably cover this. So feel free to tell me. You know, wait. Um, so for the applications, are they deployed 
it, I, I'm trying to figure out how the applications are deployed and controlled. Is it through the, ACM? again? The, yeah, and this 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 diagram, you know, lacks a little bit of that. But the applications, in order to for this this solution to work, have to be um, deployed via ACM. So okay. there's lots of ways you can deploy applications. You can use a, a GitOps. You can use um, you know, there's whatever ways ACM will allow you to deploy applications. You have to, it has to be controlled as well via ACM. Okay. That, that helps make sense to me. So, okay, good. So essentially yeah. what we'll be doing is, so we deploy an application to say cluster one using ACM, and then we yep. use the tools via ACM to set up replication of both the configuration as well as the data from yes. cluster one to cluster two. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And the, the, the new bit about this is um, we have sort of a, the glue, which is upstream project called Raman, which I'll, I'll discuss more. But the upstream project Raman DR is a sort of it has supplied the new operators and the new custom resources that ACM uses to do that that orchestration. So it's 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 pretty slick. And again, I'll, I'll get to a demo pretty quicker so we can see it in action. Um, and, and real quick, Annette, I'm sorry, is, mm -hmm. is the management cluster your hub cluster? In this context, this is for yes. one of our, yes. our viewers. Okay, yes. thank you. I mean, so so currently this is a, a, a three cluster solution. Um, within a short time, we'll be reducing that to two clusters, as well as um, it's really important that your hub cluster function uh, is, is able to be restored if for some reason it goes away. So you can either look at, you know, doing some kind of backup on your hub cluster or having some way of making sure that your hub cluster, the function of the hub cluster has to be available, right? So it, it's possible it could even live in one of the other clusters, but, but there's, you know, right now, um, this is a three cluster solution of which if you lost your hub cluster, you become sort of headless. Yeah, and, and just to poke at that a little bit more, um... Literally this morning, we got asked about, you know, can I deploy ACM to single node OpenShift? And it's one of those like, technically yes, but mm -hmm. are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. you know it 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 becomes a single point of failure. And even you know with single node OpenShift, doing an update means that everything goes down. So you know minimum yeah. you probably want a compact cluster, three nodes, um, and you know just be again cognizant of the limitations there, uh, and and how that might affect availability. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I think for, for POCs and, and things like that, you know, proof of concepts where you're wanting to reduce your footprint could certainly be a, a good solution. But yeah, you know, you, you all, this whole thing, as I first showed on the first slide, you always have to think about availability, you know, at, at every level, right? So, Absolutely. Um, so just to not wanting to confuse it uh, too much. So, so this is clearly an asynchronous solution from the point of view of persistent data. Um, so what that means is you're, you're going to use the concept of snapshots and an interval of snapshots to, so say every five minutes, you're going to snap the delta change of each persistent volume from one cluster to the alternate cluster so that you have sort of a warm standby. Um, and because of that, you know, if, if you had to use the, the alternate cluster persistent data, you are going to be missing whatever is not in the snapshot. So if your snapshot interval is five minutes, you could be conceivably losing up to five minutes of data because it never got to the other side. And a, a quick clarification. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a couple of folks ask, is this, it's only active passive? Is there any active active capabilities here? Well, this solution, I think of it, well, the way I think of it, if you think of it, that each each cluster can um, protect, uh, you know, an application on the alternate cluster, it is sort of active-active from the point of view that it's it's both directions. But if you're asking, can the global traffic manager or a geo load balancer be able to send connections to both applications at the same time? No, because the way that this works, and again, I'll show you in the demo, but the storage is only essentially promoted on one side or one cluster at a time. So I, because the storage is only promoted and available on one cluster at a time, I can't have you know the storage essentially being being replicated and available at the same time on both clusters on a per application basis. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, Jared asks, uh, can you do this without ACM? Technically, yes. Um, you can do it. Um, the, the asynchronous uh, replication method currently is um, using um, something called CEPH, C-E-P-H, mirroring. So via CEPH commands, you can set this all up yourself and schedule and do all of the orchestration for, um, you know, you would have to reinstall the ACM resources I mean, the, excuse me, the Kubernetes resources, you'd have to make sure you don't have any security context problems. So yes, it, it, it is possible, but it's not currently the way that um, Red Hat and, um, you know, OpenShift via ACM and using uh, our storage, OpenShift Data Foundation is going. Currently, um, the solution is totally uh, dependent on ACM. Yeah, so I'd say the second part of your question there, uh, Jared, is it more complex without ACM? Is a definite yes. Yeah, it, you're you're basically down in the weeds of Ceph commands on a, on a per volume basis. So you're you're basically having to do all of the orchestration yourself. So coming in the future, I just want to just put this out here. Um, it's not available yet. We're probably looking at this being available in about four or five months. So one one of the you know I guess issues or, or things is, is, is the asynchronous um, asynchronous mirroring of the data. So this solution, which will be called Metro DR multi-cluster for, for Red Hat, will use ACM in a very similar way. Um, it'll all everything about installing the applications and the automated failover, all that. But the difference is this will um, use a stretched storage cluster. It'll be from uh, OpenShift Data Foundation. And if you're familiar, it'll be called uh, Ceph. It'll be a Ceph cluster. And it'll have definitely um, the ability to do synchronous mirroring. So you, you know, your, your RPO is going to be you know, zero, essentially, from a persistent data point of view. But it does require uh, that the, the data components of the storage are latency restricted so you know maybe uh, a couple hundred miles apart for the locations or less and you also have to have a witness location or a consensus location which we call the arbiter node which is at a, a third location so the third location can can it's not as latency sensitive but you know you do have to have a third location that's required because just like at cd for um, OpenShift, um, the storage requires quorum. So even though you have two OpenShift clusters, and you know they're going to be fine once you fail over, there's no quorum issue at etcd. There would be a quorum issue for the storage. So I just want to just um, we're not going to go over this anymore today, but I just want you to know that we are working on a synchronous solution as well. Okay. And just to rewind a bit, um, somebody asked, let me see if I can find the question. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked if this is like, is the whole state of the cluster in sync between the two, you know, cluster one and cluster two. And the answer to that is no, because they're distinct clusters. They're not sharing an etcd or anything like Correct. that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas, this is not, yeah. And, and the same is true with the underlying ODF or, or the Ceph underlying ODF in this instance, right? It's two distinct ODF deployments, but we use- No, no, this, okay. So the prior slide, 100%, yes. Okay. This slide, no. This is an external, what we call ODF cluster or AKA oh, Ceph okay. cluster. And it is stretched. And that's why it has latency restrictions and it's also why it needs that third site to be the witness for Got the quorum. Got it. The, Sorry, the I, I, quorum. I, I was I was paying attention to chat and missed when you switched over to this um, this architecture. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Like I said, this is <laughs> this is three to four months down the road. Um, but I just you know for people who absolutely need a synchronous solution, which you know may be true, or then you know this this is coming um, and uses a lot of the same custom resources and operators in terms of the integration and, and automation via ACM, but it just has a difference in the in the storage plane. Got it. And and 
while we're on ODF for just a moment, Bonkstock asks um, if the Ceph cluster is running on top of OpenShift, and it is. Um, so if you're using ODF, uh, it is Ceph managed via Rook and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit. So, so this one, in terms of this solution, yes, this would be what we call ODF internal. Um, the uh, the storage would be running as pods, and and those pods would be hosted on OpenShift, and all of the alerting and managing of that storage cluster would be done via OpenShift. This solution, though, is is hooked in, so it's it's hooked into OCP. So your storage classes for creating volumes, that being file block or object buckets, that's all available to each one of those OpenShift clusters to, to do that on the storage. But the actual, there's some alerting um, about the health of the cluster, but it's not, it, you're not getting as much alerting because it's an external cluster. So the, you know, you'd still be managing the Ceph, um, Sort of a Ceph native cluster. Uh, in some in some extent, you'd still be managing it outside of OpenShift. There, like I said, there's some alerting, and Rook is definitely still the Rook Ceph um, upstream project. Rook is still doing a lot of the orchestration, but at the level of just you know storage classes and and hooking into the external cluster. But you know it's it it is an external Ceph cluster. Okay. Versus th this is totally um, managed and, and deployed and, and monitored by OpenShift. Got it. So okay. it, uh, and that with the, I'm sorry. I now I've got a question. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, so with the, the external stuff storage, um, yeah. is there any, when you have that third site, like there, well, not necessarily the Arbiter site, but when you have these, um, these sites, do you have, do you have to have like an increased amount of storage for the external cluster? Or is it like you can just kind of go same, same, and then it'll, it'll balance out as it's failing over? You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm asking that the right way. Like, it, it, if you're if you're trying to fail over to one, do you have to have like, you know, site A's, you know, capacity as well? That's just kind of sitting there cold. Well, the, are you talking about the storage plane or, or the, yeah, the storage plane? I'm sorry. On, yeah. on the storage plane, so this solution, what the, the way it works is that it requires four replicas of anything you do. So every time you do a write, it's going to be replicated four times, right? Okay. So what that does is that what we do is we have what we call a min size two. So any any volume can survive and be used for reading and writing as long as there's two replicas available. So if you if you think of just like having to switch from the cluster one to cluster two, and let's say in, in the same location as cluster one, you have um, your your you know your your two replicas for the ODF cluster and you lose those you still have two replicas available on the other site. And because the Arbiter node is not on either of those sites, the Arbiter node can reach consensus. And so therefore all of your, all of your volumes that you would switch over and use on cluster two, once they became available, they, they would all be, they, they'd be two replica now, they wouldn't be four replica, but they would all be able to be used for reading and writing. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions before we go to the demo? Um, I I have lots, but I don't want to. I want to see the demo. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, I, I didn't. Yeah, I may have confused things. I don't mean to do that. Um, no, no, you're um, you're fine. Um, and, and you know, for anybody in the audience, please don't hesitate to to send in questions. I see your question there. IDDQD. All right. Well, my, my, yeah. my, my yeah, so, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Steph if she could uh, queue up the video. And so what I'm going to do is um, there's no audio. I'm going to talk, which means I may lose my my uh, place here. But um, I'm going to try to talk to the video. I also have the same video recorded on YouTube with my audio. So um, if you can go ahead and start it, Stephanie. I don't. Maybe it's already started. There we go. Okay. So, and that's going to start talking. So we have two managed clusters. Um, the application is currently deployed on the primary cluster. And underneath we have um, OpenShift Data Foundation and on OCP. We also have a third cluster running advanced cluster management. 
you notice there's OpenShift uh, DR, that means OpenShift Data Disaster Recovery, and we'll get into that. So the process that happens here is the administrator uh, is going to initiate it on the hub cluster, the, the failover. After that, um, the metadata for the alternate cluster uh, PVs will be um, put into the, the secondary cluster. Then we're step three, um, we're going to go ahead and demote the storage, which will take the application down. Then uh, ACM is gonna redeploy the app on the secondary cluster. The IOs will be redirected via some kind of geo load balancing. And then we delete the app on the primary cluster. So it's no longer running. So in ACM, I've already imported um, two clusters. I'm gonna rename them to cluster one and cluster two. They're Amazon, one's in US East two and one is in US West two. So approximately 50, 60 milliseconds apart. And what's required is you need to, um, you need to connect these clusters. So I'm going to connect the cluster um, via an add-on with ACM that works very well now called Submariner. And you can actually deploy it from ACM uh, using a cluster set. And we can see that the connection is healthy. So this is connecting the private cluster and service networks of the two OpenShift clusters. And this is required for doing the, um, the, the, the replication. So if we now look at the, the different clusters and what operators, I talked about the operators and if you could, you know, if you're disconnected, you just need to be able to install them. So we have uh, OpenShift Data Foundation, DR cluster operator and Submariner. On the second cluster, we have the exact same thing. Um, the DR cluster operator comes with ODF and we have Submariner. So if you're looking to, um, purchase or use this capability, it does require uh, OpenShift Platform Plus and the ODF Advanced SKU. On cluster three or the hub cluster, go to all projects to look at our operators. So this is where I put advanced cluster management. We also have a new operator with ODF for multi-cluster orchestration. This is to set up the mirroring between the, the storage clusters. And then really important, we're doing the orchestration, we have the OpenShift DR hub operator. And we're, we're gonna look at the custom resources or APIs that that brings. So in terms of um, how we're going to test this or do the failover, I have installed a, a simple uh, application using GitOps called RBD loop, really simple application. Um, all it does is just write a 4KB uh, file every second to the storage. That allows me to be able to measure any outage or anything. If I look at the topology in ACM, um, it's currently running on cluster one and it has one pod and one persistent volume that it is running to. If I go to the terminal, uh, top is cluster one and the bottom is cluster two. Uh, on, on the bottom and we can see that if I look at the same namespace, um, there is nothing here, I meaning none of the resources are running yet on cluster two. They're all running on cluster one right now. So the next thing I wanna show you is how we're going to fail over. So to, to fail over, we're going to go to our hub cluster and we're going to go into the operator, operator DR hub operator. So here we're going to use a really um, nifty uh, custom resource, which is namespace scoped. So this is on a per application basis. So it's called DR placement control. So this is a, a brand new custom resource from the upstream Raman uh, DR project. And it allows us to um, set the action that we want to do for this application. And before I do that, just let me show you the RBD loop is tied in to a Grafana dashboard. And so it's, it's able to show you um, that, you know, what cluster is currently active and it shows you the, the IOs uh, and we'll see some more information on the dashboard after we fail over. 
So going back to the failing over, which we'll get there in a minute, or uh, I don't know what I was saying on the original video, but it takes some while. Um, okay, so we're back here. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, go ahead and change the action to failover. And in the CR, uh, in the YAML, it tells us that it's going to fail over to cluster two. So that is, that is something you set in the custom resource, which is what, what is my failover cluster? As soon as I save the changes to that YAML, the actions I showed in the flowchart are going to start now. And we can watch it in a couple different ways. Um, if we go back to the terminal, we can see that um, if we now look for the resources on cluster two, they're already there. And if we go back to our dashboard, um, we can see it just switched over. The, the green is under the failover cluster. So let me explain the 39 seconds. So the 39 seconds that shows there for this uh, Grafana dashboard is the amount of data loss uh, or the time of the data loss for this application. And again, it's writing 4KB every second. So what happened was the last snapshot on a five minute interval, and again, it's settable, um, was you know 39 seconds before the failover. So I, I didn't have that data on the alternate cluster, so therefore it's lost. I, I basically brought the application up on the snapshot that was last replicated. If I now go back to ACM, I can see that my application now is on cluster two. So after this, um, what we want to do is we want to try and fail back now. So to, to fail back is going to be as easy as failing over. It's just going to be a, a different action in the custom resource called uh, DR placement control. So what I'm going to do now is just change that action to relocate. And down in the YAML, it doesn't show. It tells you what is the preferred cluster for relocate. So in this case, the preferred cluster to go back to will be cluster one. So one, once I save that, we can go back to our terminal. We can see on the bottom that it's terminating the resources. Um, and if I do a watch to look on back on cluster one, I can watch right now, it's not quite recreated yet. My dashboard doesn't show that it switched over yet. And just um, while this is happening, in terms of relocate, it actually does a sync on the volume. So you don't actually lose any data on a relocate. Um, so as we see the resources come in there, we're going to basically we're bringing up the application again on cluster one. And as soon as it's running, go back to our dashboard, see it switches over. And that 40 seconds in this case doesn't represent data loss because we synced the, the volume right before. It represents application outage or RTO. So just wrapping up here, we did all the, the um, actions in the flowchart. And I think we're done, Stephanie. I'm I'm always impressed by that because it's entirely a Kubernetes centric thing, right? You're you're integrating with your operating against Kubernetes APIs to create all of those. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've got a few questions here um, that uh, came up while you were uh, while you were narrating the video there. Okay. Um, so Sachin asked a couple of good questions. Uh, so first, and it was from a while ago, is this dependent on a particular version of ACM? Like, is it ACM 2.4 or later? Or Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just mention all the, uh, the versions. So this capability is available today. So not, not you know, smoke and mirrors are showing you something that will get, get to you sometime. And the versions would be uh, ODF 4.9, which is OpenShift Data Foundation, OpenShift 4.9 and ACM 2.4. Okay. 
And then for the Raman DR operator, the disaster recovery operator, is that deployed to the ACM hub cluster or is that deployed to the, the source and destination clusters? It's deployed in all three. Um, if you go back and um, if we'll, we'll definitely get the link to the video, I, I can put that in, in uh, chat and someone can post it. It's deployed in all three. So okay. you have the, uh, it's called the OpenShift DR cluster operator and the OpenShift DR hub operator. Okay. So you, you deploy it in all three. I need, I need to start calling it by the correct name instead of the upstream project name. Yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, you know, I mean, the good part it is, it is an active project. Um, and I know the, uh, the, the contributors and maintainers are, are giving, are briefing the uh, CNCF uh, data protection working group. And there's a lot of interest, um, you know, for, for other companies, they might change out the replication method, but to, to use the orchestration. So that um, somebody asked earlier, and that kind of reminded me that um, I answered in chat, but we might want to bring it up. Um, so OADP, so the which is the OpenShift API for data protection, mm -hmm. does that fit in here at all? Well, it, it someone asked earlier, and I I said it's possible. Um, if, if you were not using ACM to deploy your application and to do the orchestration, you could use OADP to basically take a backup of your Kubernetes resources and then restore those Kubernetes resources to same cluster or alternate cluster. And while well, it'd be alternate cluster in this case, because you're doing replication uh, to a different cluster. And you could, you know, again, you would have to do all the demoting and promoting of the storage and enabling of the mirroring and all that via via Ceph commands, but um, you you could do it. There there were there are some new custom resources for volume replication, like you know. So actually, you might be able to move up some of that to doing it via um, Kubernetes or OpenShift. Okay. But again, e even if even if you can do it within a, a custom resource, it's all it's going to be per volume and it's going to be all manual. Okay. And, and just so in case anybody doesn't know OADP, so my understanding, and, and Annette, I'll rely on you to make sure that I'm right here. OADP is, it is a downstream of Valero. And the goal being to provide an OpenShift API to kind of collect all of the objects, Kubernetes objects that make up an application. Um, so- Well, it, uh, it, yeah. And it's, it's partner agnostic. And there is no, and I think you introduced me to this term. Um, you know, there there is no data mover associated with it. Well, there so, will be. Oh, that, okay. that yeah. So a couple of things on OADP, um, open yeah. So it exposes the the Valero API is totally right for backup and restore, and I think scheduling. One of the things it does have though that really ties into um, ODF and our implementation of uh, the CSI uh, features is you have the Valero CSI plugin. So out of the box, when you install ODF, you get volume snapshot classes, both for file and block. And those volume snapshot classes then can interact with the Valero CSI plugin. So not only are you backing up the Kubernetes resources, you're also able to um, create snapshots at exactly the same time. So that you have both the persistent data and then of course the snapshots would, would live in the, the storage cluster. And then you can use those snapshots to restore or basically you know, restore back to a PVC to be able to link up with the Kubernetes resources to basically recreate the application. Got it. Okay, so that's that's interesting. I think we, um, Johnny, I think you and I have already talked about having a, uh, a show dedicated to OADP as well. So that'll be a super interesting one. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a good time. Yeah, because I, I'm not sure exactly, but very soon it will go from being a community operator to a Red Hat um, supported operator in, in Operator Hub. Very cool. Um, so I, I see we have one question and apologies if I butcher your name. I'm my, my children know I'm terrible with names. So uh, Alini, Alini, um, in case of an actual disaster to cluster one, is it possible to trigger the failover from ACM afterwards? 
Absolutely. So, that, yeah, that's why currently the ACM hub is a different cluster at a different location. Um, in fact, all the triggering would be of the failover uh, would be from that third location. In the future, you know, the ACM team is looking at ways of backing up that hub, being able to restore that hub, um, having HA on the hub. So there's all kinds of solutions because you, you can see that, you know, the hub and the ability to, to trigger. So if one side is totally lights out, you can still trigger the failover actions and get, get the, the alternate site with the applications running. Mm -hmm. Now you just got to have DR for your ACM, and then you got to have DR for the exactly. ACM well, that, DR. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, turtles they, all the way down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, the ACM team is hard at work on that, and I think we'll see a, a, a viable solution in the next version of ACM. Yeah, and, and Selwyn actually just asked exactly that. You know, what, what happens if the ACM location fails? Yeah, um, it, well, it, we're, we're, we're all thinking that, yeah, we're, we, we all... We all have been uh, taught about single point of failure for sure. Yeah. So uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I, I, I think I told you all, um, well, all you, the, the folks that I'm here on the stream with, um, that I do have a hard stop today. I'm, I'm going into the tower for the first time in, in two and a half years. I'm going into Red Hat Tower. Uh, so I do unfortunately have a, a relatively hard stop. Um, so any questions that you all have, please go ahead and uh, send them in now. We'll take the last few minutes to address those. Um, and then while you're typing those up, um, I do want to highlight to everyone that, uh, so next week we will be, um, it, uh, Johnny will be the center of the, the, the star of the show. Uh, we'll be talking oh, yes. about validated plat validated patterns. Patterns. Well, Eventually, I'll stop calling it platforms, Johnny. I swear. That's okay. Um, yeah, va validated patterns. Uh, the week after that, um, which is February 9th, um, we will be talking about what is on our schedule. Um, oh, we'll be talking about the performance add on operator. Uh, and then the week after that, uh, which is February 16th, we will be, our, our stream will not be on that day. Uh, and the reason it won't be on is because that's when the What's New and OpenShift 4.10 live stream will be happening. Uh, so next three weeks are, are really busy, really interesting topics. Uh, if you aren't already subscribed on whatever platform you're watching on, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, you can also go to it's red.ht slash live stream. Uh, so that will take you to the live streaming landing page. And it has the calendar that has the big, you know, the, the big live streaming schedule on it. Um, it is a Google calendar. So if you click the um, in the bottom right hand corner, there's a thing that says add this calendar. Uh, so you can add that to your calendar and then you can get reminders for all of those as well. So thank you, Stephanie, for posting the uh, link in there. And Andrew, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Selwyn had mentioned or had requested that we have like a security topic uh, going over like how to you know secure clusters, cover FIPS, encrypting comms, secrets, et cetera. Um, so Selwyn, yeah, we can definitely have one of those coming up. Like there's, I'm sure we've got like, you're right. Each one of those is its own rabbit hole and then it can spin off to its own. Right. It, it can just get insane. But yeah, we'll definitely yeah. do something. Yeah. So um, actually, it's probably a pretty good time to do that because there was just some shuffling of team organization on the product management side. So now uh, we do have a team that is dedicated specifically full time to nothing but security. Um, so we can get the uh, get them on here and, and have a good conversation around all of that. So the compliance operator and mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, Andrew, which tower? Um, oh, yeah, Red, Red Hat Tower here in downtown yes. Raleigh. <laughs> Very good, Sachin. Very good. Yeah, Ansible yeah. Tower. Yeah. So I, I was telling Annette before we started that I had to, I, I probably spent an hour digging around for my badge uh, last night because I just I didn't know where it was. Um, I dig, dug through all of my backpacks. My wife makes fun of me because I have too many backpacks, um, you know, and, and did finally find it. But all right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions that came in. Selwyn, um, thank you, Johnny, for highlighting the topic request. Um, if there are any other things, if anything comes to mind for anybody who's watching this after it's live, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can reach me at andrew.sullivan at redhat.com uh, or on uh, Twitter at practical Andrew, uh, all one word. If you've seen me chatting in Twitch, um, that's that's my also my Twitter username. Also through Johnny under the bus. Um, so Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y at Red Hat, uh, no H. Um, and J-Rock TX1, right? Yep, yep. I got it right. Yep. Thank you, Stephanie, for throwing up our uh, information on the screen there. 
So by all means, um, you know, please reach out to us at any point in time. We're happy to uh, field those questions. Um, we'll, we'll include Annette in those as well. I won't, uh, I won't ask her to publish her information <laughs> publicly. Um, but yeah, by all means, um, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us and we will address those questions. Um, when is the OADP stream? Um, Tiger, Tiger, I feel like you have a vested interest there for some reason. I, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so we, I don't think we've scheduled it yet. Um, we were waiting for OADP to go GA, um, which I haven't checked on that. So I don't know when precisely that will be, but I do have it penciled into our schedule for, I think, March. Um, but it is penciled in, which means that it's likely to change. Um, yeah, so when we realized that FIPS has to be implemented at install, yeah, un unfortunately it does. Um, should I find uh, IDD uh, QD? I will rewatch. Uh, should I find it on YouTube? Uh, so yes, you can find it on the Red Hat YouTube channel, the OpenShift YouTube channel, or confusingly, the Red Hat OpenShift Twitch channel. Um, so all, all three of those will have uh, the stream. Um, so do be aware that if you happen to uh, prefer Twitch, Twitch does um, uh, retire those after, I think, 60 days. Um, so we also publish a blog post with each one of these. So if you keep an eye on cloud.redhat.com slash blog, we'll have a blog post that will have a link to the, um, uh, uh, to the stream embedded inside of there, as well as links to specific timestamps for um, questions and topics and stuff like that. Oh, Stephanie tells me it's 30 days. Um, all right. So, and in case anybody doesn't know, Tiger was, uh, Tiger was an intern with our team, uh, two years ago, Tiger, three years ago. Um, it was before the, uh, but before everything that happened out here in the world. So, um, and he has since joined Red Hat. So congratulations, by the way. Nice. Nice. Congrats. Welcome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your week, a great uh, uh, stay safe out there and all of that. Um, Johnny, anything from you? No, just have a great week and we'll see you next week. All right. And Annette, I will give you the last word. Yeah. So I'll a clue at C L E W E T T at red hat.com just in case. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.